welcome back to Health Impact. I'm Megan Antonelli, your host, and today I have a guest who needs no introduction. Peter Yesowich is a visionary figure who has made an indelible mark on marketing, healthcare, and hospitality, three things I care deeply about. <laughs> As chairman of the Hospitable Healthcare Partners, he's led a consultancy that bridges healthcare and hospitality, enhancing the patient experience with decades of experience and expertise. Peter has shaped programs for iconic brands like Fairmont and Disney and throughout his career. He's transformed healthcare as chief growth officer at Cancer Treatment Centers for Amer of America. And a master in the field, he's co-authored several books and that, and is also a visiting associate professor at Cornell. His journey from Cornell to, to Yale to Stanford has shaped marketing, healthcare, and hospitality. And we're honored to have him here today to talk to us about his new book, Hospitable Healthcare, Just What the Patient Ordered. Welcome, Peter. Thank you for joining us. Delighted to be here, Megan. Thank you. So tell our audience a little bit about your background, which is unique, coming from, you know, Disney all the way to healthcare, to CTCA, and um, tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, well, let me turn the clock back. I, <clears throat> when I finished school, I have a doctorate in psychology, and uh, finished school, went into the marketing business right away. Uh, service marketing and the hospitality business, as you mentioned, had a wonderful run there for 30 plus years, working with uh, brand names that your listeners would recognize. And then in the late 90s, I uh, was invited to practice uh, some of that craft on behalf of a healthcare company, as you mentioned, Cancer Treatment Centers of America, uh, because the chairman of the company at, at the time was a, uh, a believer in the, in the power of hospitality as a, uh, as a way to complement the clinical expertise of the organization to help patients uh, fight their disease. And obviously in that business, it was it was oncology. Most of the patients were uh, diagnosed with an advanced stage or a complex uh, cancer. And um, so I did that for 10 years. I, uh, so I hung up the cleats, so to speak, in the traditional marketing business. And I, I put a healthcare hat on. I learned so much about not just the business of medicine, but the practice of medicine as it relates to oncology. And, and it really, it served to allow me to kind of bear witness to what inspired this book, which is the the importance of hospitality and the delivery of care and how that impacts patients. Yeah, I think with oncology so much so because they're coming, you know, they have to come back and, you know, so many times for treatment. I mean, that's one of the, you know, really the most arduous things to go through. So I imagine, you know, I can see why that would inspire. Tell me a little bit about you know, the specifics there in terms of, you know, where you felt the need was and, and really what some of those principles of hospitality that you were able to apply. Sure. Um, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that, that I observed was the very thoughtful way that at, at CTCA, they really anticipated the level of anxiety that patients would bring to their engagement, you know, from the moment that the first phone call came in. Uh, and, and first thing I did, actually, the first day that I, I joined CTCA, I, I went to the call center, I put on a headset, and for about eight hours, I just listened to conversations that were coming in over the wire. And it was uh, amazing to me to listen to the, the sense of anxiety, the desire for information, uh, uh, and guidance, and so forth that, that was coming from, you know, prospective patients, and then and how the incredibly well-trained counselors they had there would respond to those questions. But that was just the beginning. Uh, and then the first time I entered a hospital, it felt like I was walking into the lobby of a JW Marriott hotel. You know, there was no uh, uh, clinical uh, white, you know, color palette. Uh, it was all neutral tones. There was a grand piano in the lobby uh, and, uh, you know, very soothing music, a wonderful uh, aquarium. The lighting was adjusted appropriately. There was no front desk. You were greeted personally by uh, a, a, a concierge. Uh, I mean, the whole experience was completely different. And, um, and even right down to the, the meals in the restaurant, to the accommodations for loved ones that were there with patients who were undergoing treatment. Uh, and it was a culture uh, that was born of an idea that the chairman had. And this was brilliant. And he called it the mother standard. And what that meant was um, that every employee of the organization, from a van driver to a uh, to a surgeon, um, 
was thoroughly tested uh, and vetted to live the mother's standard, and that was uh, that they would deliver a level a level of care that would be uh, appropriate for your mother in the event she were to get a cancer diagnosis, and they lived that. And anyway, I, I observed that for ten years. Uh, I, I watched the impact that had. Uh, I was uh, privileged to ghost um, uh, many rounds with uh, clinicians, uh, and I would listen to conversations with patients, many of which were extremely difficult conversations that were uh, undertaken. But I witnessed firsthand what the hospitality aspects of care delivery did to allow them uh, to uh, uh, to receive that care in, in as positive a way as as possible. Mm-hmm. That's great. I you know. I- we've talked about patient experience and the importance of that so many times. And I think that listening and that active participation of what's happening on in the floor, in the rooms with the patient is so important. But it sounds like at CTCA, they had, you know, that was there, that, that feeling that that culture was there before you got there. So what made it, you know, what made it different? And then, what is it that other organizations are missing? Because needless to say, that that is not the uh, replicable experience everywhere. Yeah, and no, it's a wonderful question. You know, I, I've thought long and hard about that. And I think the easiest way to answer <clears throat> that is at CTCA, everything was, um, w- was thought about and acted upon from the point of view of the patient. You know, and I, I think that sounds like, you know, you know, pretty mundane because you hear that all the time in patient experience, but they actually live that. Whereas in most other healthcare experiences, everything is thought about uh, and viewed through the, the lens of the provider. It's completely different, you know, when you think about that. So the provider, you know, determines when you can come in. The provider will tell you uh, where to sit. The provider will, you know, dictate all of the aspects of your care, naturally in the what they believe to be in the best interest of the patient. But what they fail to recognize is that patients don't necessarily agree uh, with their approach. Uh, they bring, you know, to the engagement uh, different levels of understanding, knowledge, anxiety, expectation, you know, all those kinds of things. And unless those are accommodated, uh, individually by the provider, what happens is there's generally a misalignment. You know, it, it starts with, you know, you and I were talking about earlier when I ask people, you know, who say, oh, it's kind of an interesting book. I said, well, let me ask you a question. Have, have you personally ever had a healthcare experience that disappointed you or went wrong? And everybody's head nods, you know, vigorously. And I say, well, let me, let me try this on. I'll bet that it had nothing to do with the clinical outcome. They say, you know, you're right. I said, I bet it had everything to do with the way the care was delivered. And that starts the conversation. They say, you know, if the provider had just kind of kind of reversed the focus of this and say, look at this through the lens of the patient, not through the process of the provider, it might take you to a different place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, and having hosted many discussions around around patient experience and and what can be done um and and bringing the patient to the table for those conversations too right. right getting that feedback and of course now i think it is pretty standard you get that feedback survey but it wasn't always and what are they doing it other than you know scoring and 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 all of that are they really responding to it i guess um what are what are some of your you know, key ways that organizations can do that, especially when I think we've talked a lot also about Mm -hmm. provider burnout and physician burnout and clinician burnout. They're overworked. Their hospitals are under-resourced. You know, it is not Disney. It is a different experience. You come with, you come with a whole set of different expectations. Um, So what is it that, you know, what are some of the things that hospitals can really do? Well, let me, yeah, let me tell you, as I mentioned, you know, we looked at 22 points of service engagement that are common to both healthcare and hospitality, ran all the analytics, and then at the back end have come kind of five themes. I'll just mention them very quickly. These are the the themes that are the, the biggest deficits, right? And the patients tell us in the delivery of, of care, healthcare versus hospitality. The number one uh, theme and the source of this kind of dissatisfaction and deficit, this probably will come as no surprise to you and to your listeners, is not knowing or understanding the cost of the service before it's provided. And if you think about that, you know, certainly more often than not, when 
people uh, present for any kind of healthcare service, it's more an, an exception than the rule that they're told what it's going to cost. And obviously we could spend a fair amount of time talking about the disappointment and surprise that occurs after the fact. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I share that again with, with healthcare administrators, they say, well, you know, it's very difficult, uh, you know, to do that. How could we fix that? I said, well, you know, as a provider, generally the kind of the range of what the, the cost of that care delivery is going to be, because you have contracts, right, with uh, providers and with insurance companies and, and so forth. But rarely is that disclosed. And one of the suggestions we make in the book, a little bit controversial, but I think it makes a lot of sense, is when healthcare providers confirm appointments, they should also, with that confirmation, send a pro forma estimate of what the cost of the care is going to be. Mm -hmm. Now, that could take us off into a different conversation, but that addresses the first kind of deficit. Second deficit, uh, not surprisingly, is that healthcare patients generally told us they don't feel that they're appreciated for their business. Now, that kind of takes it out of the realm of really the, the clinical aspect of it, but they're saying, hey, we're customers too. And, you know, when we patronize a hotel or resort or restaurant, you know, very frequently our our, our uh, staff, you know, thanking us for our business. And generally that's not the case, you know, when at least that's what consumers tell us when they consume healthcare. And believe it or not, that's the second kind of source of this kind of deficit in, in the delivery of care. The third area that came out of all the research was their disappointment with the whole uh, reception and the arrival experience and the arrival environment. And whether or not the arrival experience is welcoming, do people feel welcomed? You know, we all have jokes about, you know, showing up and we're looking through the, you know, the plastic uh, divider and there may be some rare eye contact as the receptionist is focused on the computer screen. And then you're handed the dreaded clipboard, you know, and you've got to go sit down and fill out the, and you say, wait a minute, I just filled that out three months ago when I was here. We always understand it, but we need to have you do that again. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so that whole experience and then whether or not the people they interact with there make them feel welcome or make them feel like they're genuinely interested in serving them. That's a training problem. Mm -hmm. Fourth theme, logistics. We all have a story about trying to book an appointment that's been a headbanger, right? Where we say, gee, you know, uh, well, sorry, we can't accommodate. Just today, I had an example of, I was trying to get an appointment with a dermatologist. And I was told, well, <clears throat> Our dermatologists are very, very busy, nothing available for four months. And I thought to myself, four months, that's incredible. I said, well, why don't we start this way? Why don't you tell me what is available? And then I'll tell you whether or not I can accommodate that. And, and so not to be a smart guy, but the whole idea is if you kind of turn this around and say, okay, why don't you tell us what you would like? And let's see if we can accommodate that. Now, we may not be able to do that. Now, an interesting phenomenon, I don't know if this is true where you live, um, Megan, but here where I live uh, in South Florida, we now see lots of advertisements for same or next day appointments. Mm -hmm. And you say, gee, that's kind of interesting. How is that possible? Particularly for really complicated, you know, diseases like cancer, you know, the same day appointments. Well, what they're doing is they're deconstructing the appointment. So you may not see the oncologist the same day or tomorrow. But what you would see is an intake nurse who would accommodate all of the preparation that's necessary for you to have a really constructive discussion with the oncologist. You know, it's interesting, even if you have to wait, you know, that six to eight weeks to see the oncologist, the patient experience is so much more positive because they've had at least within 24, 48 hours an opportunity to express their concerns, share their medical records, whatever it might be. Anyway, so that whole service logistics issue and then finally, the, the fifth category is uh, service assessment and recovery from bad service. Uh, you know, if you have a horrible anniversary dinner in a restaurant, what happens? You know, you're going to get complimentary dessert and a cordial, mm -hmm. uh, right? Maybe they'll take the entree off your bill. If you have a bad night in a hotel, they say, well, tell us what happened. The front desk clerk is the one that will go ahead and give you the credit. Right. You got a problem with a, with a healthcare uh, you know, procedure that went wrong. What happens then when you try to dispute that? Well, you go you go into a black hole, right? right. And you may in, involve with some kind of extended debate uh, with the insurance company. Anyway, we all know the outcome of that. 
Right. Uh, why? Why do? Why does that happen? Well, yeah. we could talk for hours about that too. But those right. are the five I mean, deficits. And I think yeah. so. That last one and that first one, where you get into some of the, you know, elements of the problems that are sort of out of the control of the health system because you are involving the insurance and the coverage. Right. However, I mean, to your point, like with cost, when I go to my dentist or my oral surgeon or my orthodontist they know and they are aware that people kind of price shop because mm -hmm. they know that the coverage is, you know, we all know that our coverage is, sure. isn't going to be full. So they do do all that stuff for us, right? They contact the insurer and they say, okay, this is going to cost this and this is going to cost that. Right. And, you know, and, and they're able to do it. So that service is part of what they provide knowing that there's, you know, that that choice is being made. And I think, you know, with elective care and non-emergent care, it is a lot easier, of course, right. and, and health systems, you know, can certainly get that. And I think, you know, we talk a lot about technology and automation, and these are things that, you know, those contracts are signed. The, you know, it's not, it's not like that, you know, we're negotiating, you know, new, new contracts with a payer every time someone walks in the door. Yeah. And the reality so, is that, you know, for most of, most, if not all of those elective procedures, that there is a prior approval that is given right. by the insurance company, you know, before the appointment is confirmed. So, you know, when I, when I make that suggestion to providers, they say, well, you know, you, you can't do that because we don't know what we're going to find when we get in there. I say, I understand that. So you do a pro forma estimate with the disclaimer that the, the range estimate that you've been given is subject to change based on tests that need to be conducted, right. uh, the examination and so forth. And and I think just just giving patients that 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 preliminary look at what the cost might be, according to our work, would go a long way toward resolving the deficit, the number one deficit that they tell us they have in, in the consumption of healthcare, which is not knowing the cost or not understanding the bill. Right. And what's your recommendation to health systems in terms of how to do this? Do you tell them, you know, start with, you know, start with the finance department or do you start, you know, because it sounds like at CTC, it was a, it was a culture of service that they built in across the organization, Correct. Correct. but some organizations may not have the resources to do that. What are the, you know, what are your sort of best practices or advice? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and it's a complicated answer, but it requires the, you know, the integration of, first of all, a commitment from senior management that says we believe patients have a right to know and that we want to, to the best of our ability, want to give them that. By the way, you know that uh, the proclamation that uh, the Trump administration uh, endorsed back in 21 about hospitals having to publish now uh, the, the prices for 300 common procedures, you know, on their websites. And even as of last week, uh, press reports in, in the healthcare trades is a lot of hospitals are still not compliant with that. They're still fighting it, you know, because the idea is, you know, we've all read stories about, you know, people who shop a, an MRI or people who shop a colonoscopy, you know, and they find these incredibly wide variances in prices. Well, the whole idea is the providers know what it's going to cost them to, within reason, you know, to deliver that care. They just don't disclose it. So, my answer to your question is you do a pro forma estimate with a range, which which is known at the time the appointment is confirmed because an approval was given to see the patient mm -hmm. with a disclaimer that says, you know, this is subject to change based on. And again, it's not going to be precise, but it's going to be probably in the ballpark. And, and that that goes a long way toward helping patients understand to help them make a decision, you know, as to what it is they want to do. And it, what it does is it minimizes the risk associated with the unpleasant experience after the fact of, you know, getting a bill that you don't understand or one that you want to dispute. And, you know, the whole other other thing that um, that we looked at, which will in, uh, be intriguing to you, is the whole concept from hospitality of a performance guarantee. You know, and years ago, Holiday Inn was the first one to say that, you know, best surprise is no surprise. So if you stayed with them for a night, you didn't like it, they'd say your, your stay was for free. So we say, is that applicable to healthcare? And as it turns out, there's one hospital system in the country, it's in Pennsylvania, 
that uh, has a program called Proven Experience. It's the Geisinger Health System. It started a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, very progressive thinking. And they say, well, you know what? As a patient, <clears throat> if you have an experience with us that is unsatisfactory, now it's not the clinical outcome, but it's all of the elements of care delivery. Unsatisfactory, uh, you can... You can express that dissatisfaction to a patient advocate, and it's the patient advocate, by the way, not somebody sitting in the accounting office uh, who renders the decision. Mm -hmm. And if they determine that uh, your grievance was legitimate, then what? guess what? Then they'll refund your copay. Uh, so you don't have to pay for it. And we thought, right. wow, that's really an interesting idea. Why isn't it more health systems don't pursue that? Right. Because that's a testament to their belief in their own credential, you know, that yeah. they really do. Sure. Anyway, that's so amazing. there's a lot of good stuff in the book on, yeah. on some of no, those I'm, principles. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's amazing. And it is, I mean, it's kind of in this, I mean, the discussion of cost transparency has been a long, long one and, and hospitals are so slow to come to the table with those, with those prices as, you know, uh, and, and if you think about the service and the what you get and, you know, whether it's airlines, you know, which are notoriously not the great greatest in front of us or service, but Ritz Carlton to, um, you know, Starbucks, right? I mean, right. the cost is there. It's transparent. You, you know, it's not um, and it does reduce your anxiety, right? You know that it's not, you know, you're not going to get this big bill at the end. Whereas when you go to a restaurant and the prices aren't on the menu, you're uh -huh. always a little nervous. <laughs> But, you know, it's really interesting. One of the things that that uh, has accelerated the growth of the hospitality industry that we still don't see in healthcare is this whole concept of, of yield management and pricing. And, you know, the whole idea is that, as you know, when you go online to book a hotel room, you have a choice as to when you want to go because the prices are different, uh, which day of the week you know, uh, which room you want. In the airline business, you have choices between different times of day and where you want to sit and all those kinds of things. In healthcare, you have no choice. Not and we, we ask the question, well, why is that? Wouldn't it make more sense if, um, you know, healthcare consumers had some element of choice so they could decide, well, I'll go in for a scan on a Saturday morning, not a Tuesday morning, if I can get a 10% discount or something, you know? So the whole that's a whole revolutionary thinking around that as well. Right, right. That would be amazing. Yeah. No, and I, I think, you know, choice, transparency, um, and then the elements of experience that you talked about. I think in some cases, some of the organ some of the health systems are even overcompensating because they they aren't able, they feel that they're not able to impact the transparency or the right. um or the cost in that they don't have total control over that. So they overcompensate with respect to the the experience and in terms of the grand piano and all of that i mean is you know i think it does make it does make a difference when you walk in and you feel that but um and then you know as you, you know we talked a little bit about competition you know i mean this environment is changing it's not just um you know which cancer hospital are you going to go to or which ER are you going to go to based on times but it's are we going to even leave our home for the care that we need so mm -hmm. what are your, what are your conversations with folks mm -hmm. about you know about that um, shaping yeah you know? well you know that's one thing that um, we say <clears throat> kind of looms on the horizon that we think is going to accelerate a lot of what we advocate in the book and, and that is uh, transparent transparency and pricing as we've just discussed number one which is not only being driven by consumer choice, but it's being legislated, you know, as I mentioned a moment ago. And I think we're going to see more of that, number one. But number two, um, if you think about the architecture of the healthcare industry, it's primarily a lot of independents and local and regional providers. Uh, that's the way the hospitality business began back in the 60s. And now, as you know, there are probably four or five kind of very large holding companies that dominate the landscape. They have different brands, but they dominate the landscape. And the common kind of thread in all of that is their loyalty programs. So if you think about Hilton has something called Honors and Marriott has something called Bonvoy. So it doesn't matter if you stay at a residence inn or a Marriott or a JW Marriott, that program is available in all those locations. And that's designed to generate repeat patronage. That was driven by competition, the need to do that. And we think that the healthcare industry is rapidly approaching that point in time where the same thinking is going to apply. And that is as more and more hospital systems acquire others, as hospitals acquire physicians' practices, uh, and, and there's this consolidation underway, the issue of competition is really going to start to percolate. 
And that's where this whole concept of the patient experience becomes more than a nice thing to talk about because uh, that that news is going to spread like wildfire on social media and other places. Right. And patients are going to exercise that choice. And all of a sudden, the dimension of patient experience mm -hmm. becomes a competitive advantage, you know, for right. providers because of the competition. Yeah. Right. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I mean, no one wants to be a frequent flyer, but as we as we shift the, you know, you yeah. know, when we all say how healthcare is not meant to be a sick care system, we need to switch that. And if we switch it to this, what it needs to be, if we evolve in the right direction, whereas a preventative care, you know, and a care management you know, program and platform, then those types of rewards and, um, you know, frequent flyer miles, if you will, actually, you know, start to start to pay up, right? Because that's a, yeah, that's a very controversial idea. You know, when I discuss that with, uh, with uh, more traditional uh, healthcare providers, and they, I can tell from their body language that they get kind of upset when I say that, but I, I say, just think about this. You know, not only did the consolidation of hospitality contribute to its growth, but the other was the philosophy that that you could identify groups of, in that example, customers that shared different value systems. Uh, and once you did that, you could create programs that would recognize that. So the, the whole thesis was, as long as you treated everybody the same way, you could serve them differently, right? So you could have them check in in a different line. You know, you could have them stay on a different floor. You could have them pick their seat first. You know, you have more overhead bin space, you know, and they say, you know what? People accept that. And they say, well, I don't need all that bin space, but I want a cheaper ticket, you know? And he said, okay, well, so the whole idea is that as long as you treat them, they all get the same quality of the meal and security mm -hmm. in the airport but you can serve them differently. Now that's a radical idea in healthcare, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but we think it's an idea that you're, you're going to see uh, begin to emerge because and you already are with concepts like concierge medicine, for example. Right. Right. People are paying uh, for that already. Just right, not exactly. you know, maybe your yeah. regular. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. But even, you know, and you know, the, the comment that I typically get when I introduce that is you say, well, you know, you can't, provide those kinds of inducements because it's against the law. And I said, well, I understand it's against the law if it's financially based for Medicare and Medicaid. I'm not, that's not what I'm suggesting. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is that you might want to identify and reward people who say are more interested in say, say nutrition, you know, as it relates to their well-being. And you invite them to uh, attend uh, lectures on how to prepare food in a more healthy fashion, how to shop healthy, you know, how to, you know, I, there are all kinds of educational right. programs that Ways would enhance their well-being. Yeah, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be financial, but it can be mm -hmm. educational to enhance their well-being. Right, yeah. or even incentivizing. I was talking to Dr. Gita Nayar this morning, actually, who is, um, she's recently written a book as well. Um and, you know, about misinformation and mm -hmm. how the marketing and patient information piece of the health system needs to, you know, improve, basically, right. you know, that they're right. not doing enough to advocate, you know, sort of the truth and the science behind the medicine that they, they need to preach and that, um, you know, that there there's an opportunity there. And to some extent, it's like rewarding your patients or, you know, even the community by having them engage in some of these types of educational right. activities, right? right? So that you right. have, so you increase literacy, you know, and healthcare literacy within the communities without, um, you know, by, by giving those types of, you know, moderate incentives, whatever they may be. Yeah. And that's, that's a um, fascinating question and a, obviously a looming problem, you know, and, and uh, as it relates to, you know, the, the accuracy and the veracity of, you know, what people find on these online reviews and so forth. And, and I think healthcare can learn a lot from hospitality by looking at how they've tried to deal with this because they, you know, for years they've been dealing with things like false reviews and, and critiques and, you know, and we don't see a lot of that in healthcare right now. Uh, I suspect we will as competition becomes more prominent, but uh, you're absolutely right. That's a, it's a critical issue. All the more reason why, uh, you know, transparency is is critical because uh, the truth has a way to out, you know, uh, now that now we've got another thing to deal with, with this whole AI <laughs> situation, but mm -hmm. but it's a very critical question. And I, and I agree with that. And I certainly endorse the need for accuracy there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, no, it's um, 
you know, it, it is a, it's a brave new world out there in terms of that. Tell me a little bit, I mean, as you, I'm sure, watch hospitality closely and that, you know, it has changed, right? I mean, right. that consolidation that's happened. Um, what are the top things that they're doing right that maybe healthcare is nowhere even near yet, but should sure. be thinking about? <laughs> uh, great question. Number one is hospitality prepares for guest arrival. Healthcare doesn't. What does that mean? Um, <clears throat> I sign up for a program, I disclose all my information, where I live, my credit card, and so forth. So when I show up, they don't have to ask me 10 questions that I got to fill out every time I show up. And by the way, if I show up in Hermosa Beach, uh, I don't. they don't need to ask me questions there if I show up in Dallas or if I show up in Miami. It's all in the system, right? right. Uh, healthcare providers just don't do that. Um, the other is this, this whole concept of uh, understanding my personal preferences. Uh, the again, I'll go back to the hospitality business. They know that I like a high room away from the elevators, and I like uh, uh, I like a certain type of pillow, right? That's all in my record. Uh, so they don't have to ask me that every time I show up. They can anticipate that. And now, unfortunately, in healthcare, they got to ask me that every time because they haven't thought ahead to create these uh, what we call CRM programs, customer relationship management programs, the databases that basically record preferences. And, and people are more than happy to disclose that information if it's confidential and treated as confidential, if it will facilitate their consumption. And hospitality does that very, very well to the point where you don't even have to stop at the front desk to give your credit card to check out. You just walk out, you right. know, and, and everything works beautifully. Try that in a hospital. Yeah, right. <laughs> I know. know. We didn't really talk about discharge of the hospital. Oh, yeah. It's often the most painful. And that's when you're they're leaving. You'd think you'd want to at least them to make them happy sending them on their way. But uh well, we go through in the book, we go part. through those those five. We have a model in the book we call the payer model. You get a kick out of this. It's uh, when I say payer, most people in healthcare say, oh, P A Y O R, and their heads turn. I said, no, it's P A E E R. Mm -hmm. And the P stands for prepare. The A is to anticipate. The E is the first, first E is engagement. The second E is evaluation, and the R is reward. So we have a model in the book, which we've introduced uh, five steps. And for each of them, we have uh, very specific activities, uh, Megan, that answer the question you just asked, which is, well, how is it different in hospitality and things that we think healthcare providers could do to uh, to really improve the patient experience? Well, that's great. That's perfect. Well, tell tell our audience a little bit how to reach you and how to find the book. Uh, very simple. Go to Amazon.com and Google hospitable healthcare. A lot of people say, well, it's hospital healthcare. No, no, it's hospitable healthcare. Mm -hmm. And when I say that, they finally get the, the because it's an oxymoron, right? For a lot of people, <laughs> right? They, oh, I finally got it. I finally got it. Yeah, yeah go so to good. Amazon, go to Barnes and Noble. It's on all of those. Or if you want a little more uh, information uh, before you uh, might order the book, go to hospitablehealthcare.com. We have a website up uh, that gives you a couple of data points, got some great videos in there from uh, healthcare providers who are at the top of their game uh, and hospitality people at the top of their game. Um, and uh, it's got our payer model in there too. So you can take a look at that as well. Hospitable healthcare, hospitablehealthcare.com. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Peter. That was great. And I look forward to seeing you hopefully on, a, on, on stage in person sometime soon. It'll be a pleasure. Thanks for the conversation. It's been a lot of fun.